welcome to the 50th episode of the British Academy of Jewelry podcast. Having started the podcast in the 2020 April lockdown to support the jewelry industry during this challenging time, it is both surprising and exciting we have come to the 50th episode already. So far, I've immensely enjoyed selecting, interviewing and promoting important industry guests jewelry makers and thinkers, and I hope you, the audience, have enjoyed me taking you on a journey through the jewelry field. To mark the 50th episode, I thought it was time you got to know a little bit about me, your host, and my work and research, and that we discussed jewelry podcasting and the importance of providing a platform for creative approaches, ideas, and opinions. For this reason, I reached out to a fellow jewelry podcaster. She's a jewelry historian, most known for her work as stylist and editor at British Vogue, and author of several books on the subject of jewelry. As the host of the podcast, If Jewels Could Talk, she is used to interviewing guests. And for this episode, I will trust the esteemed Carol Woolton to also ask some questions to me for once. Carol, thank you so much for joining me as co-host on this special episode of the British Academy of Jewelry podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I have very um, warm recollections of coming to give the graduation speech at the British Academy of Jewelry during lockdown. And I had such a wonderful time with all the students and and coming out of lockdown, it was an extraordinary moment and one that I, you know stays with me just to feel their enthusiasm. And in fact, at that evening, it was still a, an evening where you had to come and prove you'd had your, your negative test, you had to wear masks. But the enthusiasm of these young people literally charging towards me, having given my speech, I just thought, there's no way we can have masks. We have to have some proper interaction here. And um, I stayed for hours and... Um, and kept in touch, and I'm, I'm still in touch with some of them now. It was a very special evening. So thank you for inviting me back again. So, Carol, before I hand over the reins for you to ask some questions to me, I do want to ask a few questions uh, to you. To start, please could you tell our audience a little bit more about yourself, your career, what it is that you do? Well, um, I um, have been immersed in jewellery. I actually studied fashion. I studied at the um, London College of Fashion, University of the Arts. And my very first job was on Vogue many years ago. And I haven't been there all the time, now, although I'm still on the Vogue masthead. I wound my way back to Vogue as um, a jewellery director 25 years ago. A few years ago, I wanted to concentrate on my books and other projects, so I became a contributing editor. But it's always been jewellery for me, and I used to give talks sometimes at Vogue in the boardroom to various people and sort of say, don't tell all the fashion editors, but jewellery is so much more interesting. It has so many more levels and depth. And what I particularly like at Vogue, obviously, I... I talked a lot about the new and what was happening and style but uh, I've always just been fascinated by the culture the history like the British Academy of Jewellery in lockdown I felt a little isolated I felt removed from everything you weren't talking to colleagues every day you weren't talking to anybody really family a lot of phone calls and I thought what can I do and I started a podcast and it's called If Jules Could Talk, and on it, I can tell in-depth stories of all the things I'm interested in, which I think if I'm interested, other people are going to be interested, and in a way that you actually can't do in magazines anymore. They, they don't have the space. They're driven by the new, and you can't really delve back. And on my podcast, I like to go all over the place. So I might go back to the Viking Age and trace a bead from Gujarat in India to a Viking grave in Derbyshire. And then the next week, I'll talk to Brooke Shields about how she loves Edwardian and Art Deco jewellery and how she wears that and what it means to her on film. You know, I talked to the director, Emerald Fennell, about jewellery as well. Julian Fellows about Downton Abbey. Ellen Morojnik, the costume designer of Bridgerton. Um, and... National Portrait Gallery about Tudor portraiture and which of Henry VIII's wives had the greatest jewellery collection. 
So I kind of dart around because for me, jewellery is at the intersection of everything. It's religion, design, romance, fashion, art. I mean, literally, it comes into everything that we do. So I started my podcast and just really enjoy doing it. And in fact, now I'm writing a book about it because Simon and Shasta wanted a book around the podcast. So we have a book about the podcast coming out next year. And I just have a book this week published by Rizzoli about Dolce & Gabbana and their fine jewellery, which was launched in Puglia in Italy this summer. So I had a wonderful time there talking to their high jewellery clients. And um, Helen Mirren, Dame Helen Mirren was there and Kim Kardashian and Casey Affleck and just more celebrities than you could shake a stick at for their Altamoda show. And they very generously hosted a the most glamorous book launch that anyone's probably ever had. So <laughs> that's what's happening with me at the moment. But it's always been jewellery and it's my subject and I'm endlessly fascinated and always learning. Uh, always love talking about jewellery. So thank you for asking me on. Perhaps to underpin your interest in jewellery, do you remember your first encounter with the medium and then what sparked you to go into a career that did end up focusing a lot on jewellery and you're on the fifth series of the If Jewels Could Talk podcast which is in looking into a range of subjects there is so much there what was it that that made that first moment that sparked that interest for you? Well I think a it's always been there you know I used to have little rocks of rose quartz growing up and I used to go off sort of you know, if I earned any pocket money collecting little bits and pieces and, you know, go foraging in junk shops and, and finding little things that I love to keep that I seem precious to me. So it was always there. But I have to say, as a journalist, I I was just driven to jewellery, A, for the, um, the interest I had to educate myself more. And then if you can get paid to do that, that that's the um, the ultimate goal. And also no one was doing it. Nobody was doing it. There was no jewellery editor in the whole of Condé Nast. And I came in and persuaded, first of all, um, Tatler magazine to make me a jewellery editor. When I moved on to Vogue, every magazine took a jewellery editor. It became the thing. Plus it coincided with the fashion brands, you know, like Maybe 25 years ago when Victoire de Castellan started at Dior, some of the fashion brands were coming into jewellery in a big way and influencing design and influencing the landscape in magazines. And so it, it, it really took off. Whereas when I started, jewellery came under accessories. It came like with hosiery or lingerie or shoes or something like that, where, of course, for me... It's um, one of the most important things that we wear and the um, thing that tells the most about a person. It's all about identity and, and culture and civilization and where you've come from. And so, of course, for me, it was very important. So I spent my time fighting for pages and fighting for stories. But on my podcast, I have the freedom to, to tell all of this, Sophie. You know, because you've taken on this, the reins of um, BAJ podcast, what it was that drew you to jewellery originally. And perhaps a little bit different than you, actually. When I was really young, I was really interested in making things, you know, creative activities, drawing, but also really making three-dimensional objects. I think it's for this reason that I got recommended to choose, even in my high school course already, sort of an art qualification. and following on from graduating at 18 years old in Belgium it's really traditional to choose a bachelor course at that stage and I went around to look at several bachelor courses and got recommended by a tutor to sort of look at jewelry because you're very precise and you're very sort of detail oriented and you you enjoy making objects have a look at at jewelry courses and I walked into the jewelry workshop at the Royal Academy in Antwerp for the first time and it was the smells, the metals, the, the, the atmosphere in that workshop that I thought, this looks really interesting. I didn't even think about sort of the connections between objects and people or anything like that. It was really that the techniques, the, the materials, the, 
the objects that were in display there that I thought this looks like something I want to do. I ended up, you know, working as a jeweler following my my graduation. I ended up going first into a master's um, in Hasselt and then and went on to do a master's at the RCA. And, and have ever since produced work for exhibitions, galleries, and clients. But after graduating, I did also really miss sort of an educational community. Working in your own studio means that you are perhaps a bit isolated. You are only talking to yourself, only critiquing your own work. And for that reason, I actually started working in education quite quickly on. I've worked in quite a few educational institutions over the years, but joined the British Academy of Jewellery 10 years ago as a, as a tutor. And then in the institution grew on to take on more responsibilities until I was the head of academy. So more or less the principal of the school. And even though I really loved that job, reviewing strategic direction of the institution, thinking about the curriculum and renewing the curriculum, particularly with this bachelor course that they were keen to start running, I had a lot of involvement in that, and then setting up international project, I actually did decide in 2019 to sort of take a small step back from education and focus on research again at the University of the West of England at the Centre for Print Research back into that making which is where a lot of my passion also is Uh, this was just before the COVID-19 pandemic and I wanted to still help with the graduates I still wanted to do something for the industry just like you I was isolated I thought what better way to do so than to invite some some of the contacts I'd made in my roles some of the people I'd been in touch with through research and you know have some episodes about what students could do or people who were in the industry could do with their free time so how to take a really good photograph how to start an online shop all these sorts of things that we could do whilst we're in lockdown and the the list of guests kept growing and lockdowns started and ended and yeah the BAJ podcast just carried on and now I do this on a monthly monthly basis basically so were you in, in a drawn at all by the German polishing industry in Antwerp? Did that pull you in at all? I would certainly say yes. I mean, I knew about the Antwerp history of diamonds. I, I grew up in a village very close to Antwerp. So I was very much, um, you know, looking at that industry from afar because it, it wasn't that I was part of the family where jewellery was something that they did. It It's certainly something that I got into because of my studies and then because of the network I built so it wasn't that it was a generational decision but it was certainly something that interested me. And when you graduated from the RCA I think it was one of the years I was judging wasn't I with doing the Theo Fennell award I went for years to the Royal College it was our sort of annual thing and and um, you won the overall excellence, the award for overall excellence, Sophie. Yes. And what was your um, collection? Yes. So my collection was titled The Alchemical Jeweler. The title this sort of, to saw my work as The Alchemical Jeweler came from a tutor who really wanted me to identify a label for all of the work that I had there. And the, the, the practice that I uh, developed really looked into my, my two main interests, which is jewellery as, a, as a, a medium, what we see as jewellery, the materials jewellery is made of, and, and the way it gets formulated. But then secondly, I've, I've also got a very big interest in scents. My dad is a chef. And so I grew up in a kitchen, more or less, where everything was always to be smelled. Um, he also had a catering shop. So when you, I was helping out in the shop, it was smell everything that comes through your hand as you are passing it on to a customer. You cannot be tasting things, but you are continuously smelling. I remember as well, when I was a kid, he would stand in one room and shout, the soup is ready, and he just smelled it. So smelling was a, a sense for me that I used it wasn't ex- something extraordinary it was just something that was always there and as soon as I you know walked into a workshop it was the smell the metals have s- distinct smells so smell and and the idea of, of jewelry were two things I really explored in my work at the RCA and beyond I really was sort of obsessed with looking for new and innovative ways to to sort of change what is considered a traditional approach 
So I, for example, produced work, a poster that indicated the, the changing price of gold throughout the years. I had a collaboration with Dr. Jordi Melbourne, um, embedding nano gold particles into resins. So you created materials that had incredibly different and, and exciting color properties that weren't very common um, at the time. And then I also made a lot of work about reimagining how we wear perfume, for example, through a pen where you have disappearing ink that you write a message on the skin and then the ink disappears and the message can only be smelled or a book where people could basically cook their own recipes for solid perfumes, reimagining what it means if you have actually all the ingredients in your garden, in your kitchen, and you create your own perfumes that way. So I did a, a lot of objects and, 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 and a series of work in, in that regard. And so my tutor said, okay, you need this title. And alchemists, to me, are curious individuals interested in the transformation of matter and materials in, in general. So I looked at my bookshelf and I had these, the alchemy of scents, the alchemy of gold, the alchemy. And I thought, okay, I don't have to look any further for a title. You know, the alchemical jeweler was sort of born. And I think my practice is rather alchemical in nature. Have anything to... to... Um, jewels that relate to um, smells and one was by the French vine jeweler Lawrence Bomer who some years ago at I think it was at Masterpiece Fair he launched a rose and a rose that actually did then have a scent and I can't remember how he did it now and then it, when I was at the Tucson Gem Fair a few years ago um, there was a um, Brazilian jeweler who worked with um, crystals and rose rouge related quartz mainly and she made sort of teardrop uh, shapes to hang on hoops as earrings. But in the back, she drilled tiny holes. You bought them with um, little essential oils, which smelt of flowers. And you just drop them in every day. And the idea was that you had the sort of benefit of the crystals and their energetic power, as well as the essential oils all day. So it, it was very interesting because... Traditionally, of course, it's the only sense really that jewellery, I suppose, taste and smell are the only senses that jewellery doesn't appeal to. But there is a bit of a history between jewellery and metalwork and um, scent because before liquid perfume was invented, you had these pomanders mm -hmm. and they were these round shaped where you had these compartments for smell, particularly super popular in the in the Middle Ages. So when you sort of, of course, with the invention of sort of liquid perfume and the way we see perfume today, those designs have largely disappeared, uh, aside from a couple of examples, and for example, the one you've just mentioned. But there is a history and there is something very interesting, because if you think about it, the reasons we wear perfume is about identity. It's about personification of yourself. You, they're very valuable. The materials that are used to create perfumes are incredibly valuable. So it's often jewelry. And there are some parallels. Perhaps the only difference between, big difference between smells and, and perfumes and jewelry is that the one is very tangible and the other is intangible. But in my work, that became a topic, something to explore, uh, making a, a, a necklace out of scented wax that then would disappear in the air after a while and working with these stamps that stamp a message that you wouldn't see after a moment. So this, this intangibility of smell became a real interesting topic. I also made a series of glass rings that you end up preserving the smell just to have a longer lifetime for it because when you spray on a scent, it disappears, it evaporates. So by enclosing it into a piece of jewelry and glass, you could not smell the oil or whatever was inside but you then decided to break, to sacrifice a piece of jewelry to then have the intangible property of the smell. So I think that there, there are there is a little bit of history there and there is certainly an, an area that is interesting to explore as jewelry artist as to what is that connection between the two. So that did drew me to make quite a, a bit of work in that area. Well, actually talking about Pomandas and we were talking about the COVID pandemic, of course, in the Middle Ages, they used the pomanders as a sort of protection against noxious, toxic fumes, because literally everything would be thrown into the street, you know, putrid, fetid carcasses of animals and 
dirty water and anything got sloshed into the street. So they would carry these pomandas to sort of release with its um, kind of decorative um, silver gilt covering to let the fumes out because they felt that was the protection because the, the bad fumes would lead to sickness. And I, I, I thought of it at the time in, in COVID that we had to wear these awful masks and things. And I thought, how much better if we had decorative commanders just to wave in front of us and to carry carry on our belt and keep disease at bay. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> maybe to the NHS to give out some dual commanders to everybody. It'd be an, an exciting commission. But um, what do people on the podcast respond to? What do they want to hear about? Do they want to hear about making people's careers, how to get into business? What what do they focus on and enjoy listening and hearing about? I think the podcast has been a, a range of topics, really. I think in the beginning, it was what really drew the audience in or what was really helpful is that it was practical advice, you know, how to do something whilst we were locked down, how to use our time. But as the podcast developed, it was, you know, thinking about speaking to people who were using unique materials, um, such as aerogel or innovations with techniques such as granulation or mokumogame. I've really started speaking to a range of, of people from a range of different backgrounds. Sustainable jewelry, you have touched upon sustainability in your podcast perhaps me from more from a maker's point of view how can you be more sustainable in your jewelry practice the podcast's big difference perhaps between your podcast and, and the one I do is that it is really made like made for the jewelry industry made for people who perhaps know a little bit about jewelry already are students or graduates from jewelry it's really focusing on some advice and guidance and then insights into other people's practice um artists makers designers the way it's developed is that I haven't really planned it as much in advance. I have a conversation with someone and a topic is mentioned and then that ends up leading into who is potentially the next speaker. So I went to a conference and covered the conference for those people who could not attend the conference and then artificial intelligence was mentioned and then the next podcast I end up speaking to someone who's working with artificial intelligence to create jewellery or jewelry research, research in the jewelry area. So none of the topics are programmed. I, I don't, it's really a bit of ad hoc conversations that are very informal, that are recorded to then share. And then they're often really commenting on what is, you know, current in, in the in the industry or current in our, our general context. And I think as the podcast developed, it's what I'm really passionate about is that we really anyone in our industry can expand their horizons um, and engage in, in really the important conversations of our time, you know, sustainability, materiality in a digital age, post anthropocentric thinking, you know, what does it mean to make jewelry for people when we know that it, we cannot be so people centered anymore? Can we make jewelry that is about the world or giving, you know, doing good for the world rather than it being all about us. So this is also a topic I've been really sort of pondering with guests. We live in challenging times and I believe artists, designers, jewelry makers are as capable in formulating opinions and that they should be involved in crafting the future. So that's been sort of the, the bit for the jewelry podcast. I think, you know, that's, I think I said that at the graduate show actually, that you know, they are going to be the people who document our era because that is what will survive into the future and that will tell of the era in which it was made. So they have an important role in, in that. Absolutely, totally agree. I wondered, uh, you, you mentioned the research that you were doing, that you've gone back to research. What are you researching at the moment? And that's at the University of the West of England, you said. Yes, yeah, so I was very lucky to get Craft Council Research Fellowship and a role as Research Associate at Centre for Print Research, where I started looking into the growth of crystals. I was really lucky to have the opportunity to visit the Hochschule Trier in Germany. During my visit, we visited a company that produced lab-grown crystals for industry. And even though I had been in the industry for really some time and, you know, I've been taught gemology, I really hadn't heard much about these man-made materials. 
And it struck me at this time that this was potentially quite a massive gap in my own understanding. And of course, you know, being a bit alchemical in nature, being an alchemist, I thought this is incredibly interesting to be able to grow your own crystals. So when the opportunity arose to do a PhD, and in particular when discussing my work with my mentor, Adrian, I saw I was really interested in this idea of growing crystals as a technique and ultimately how we today value these these materials, because they are, of course, uh, different than the materials that we mine, for example. So the PhD ended up formulating around three case studies. The first one I'm working with man-made crystals that are there, um, interrogating the context in which they are valued, but also really looking at waste materials in that industry as well and how they could be interesting for jewelry designers. I led a workshop at the Hochschule Tri where the participants were invited to use diamond dust grit waste from tools, for example, and how that could be a really interesting, sustainable approach to, to reusing these materials. I've discussed on some of my podcasts is that it's grown by using heat and pressure, huge amounts of heat and pressure and energy to grow it, and a lot of water that may be not recycled. So there is a, it isn't this sort of perfect solution. Plus, we do have a lot of diamonds. And I think the, the method of, say, culturing pearls came about because there were no pearls left. It was either culture them or have no pearls. I think we're not in that situation with gemstones. We have a ton of gemstones. So, you know, arguably we don't need to waste this energy. Um, although in industrial purposes, it's obviously incredibly helpful and you have to keep moving things forward. But it has struck a chord with some young people. But I think that's because they think they're buying sustainably. And I'm not convinced. But I think sort of buying it, saying I'm I'm saving the planet, I am not convinced by that argument. I really think it depends on who is producing them, where they are produced, and and for what purpose they are produced. But in particular in industry, because you know tools are made from diamond, often made man-made diamond, because you need to produce airplanes or you need to produce machinery. So when you then think about that waste that comes from those tools, when they are reclaimed, that grit is reclaimed after it's been used, it's that that waste, that usage of the waste is, is certainly a sustainable approach to, to thinking about these man-made materials. But in the second case study, I'm working with Dr. Daniel Wrights on creating new materials as well. So we have been working together. He's created this incredible material that glows in the dark and how materials that are not available in the in the world to be mined, but actually have these specific properties could create pieces of jewelry that are new innovative outcomes. So that's the second look at sort of what can we do if we actually grow things that are not imitating nature, but that are actually doing something totally new. And then in the third case study, I am actually growing some stones myself, but I'm very interested in growing um, something that's already, for example, been broken, or if you have a, an old ruby and it's you know cracked or chipped or something, and you then embed it into a piece of jewelry and then continue growing it. That is something that I've been trying to do in the lab myself, but on a DIY sort of approach. And I think this this is interesting, particularly also from a research point of view, to investigate the, the methodology, how we make things. As a jewelry designer, I've been trained, you know, you can go to a, to a gemstone shop, you can buy the exact stone that you need, um, or you can use a reclaimed stone from, from another piece of jewelry, and you'll design your piece around this fact of what this stone looks like. But when you are working with nature when you are growing something then you are handing over a little bit of this design method to this process particularly when you do it in the way that I do it it's been investigating these claims of sustainability on some sort and I think we should all be very careful about saying that every lab grown diamond is more sustainable that's certainly I think not the case um, but there are things there that are interesting to designers that we shouldn't discard either, that we should be open to, for example, new materials, for example, the opportunity to use the waste more creatively and value that waste as well, as much as other gemstones are valued. So there are some options there.
Well, I mean, if you're interested in new materials, um, Wallace Chan, the Chinese designer, has been showing this week at Christie's um, a retrospective of his work. And of course, he came up with this um, porcelain, which is, you know, A, very beautiful and has a great luster, but is five times harder than steel. And actually, I saw one of his um, very detailed elephants in titanium, and the tusks are this lovely porcelain, sort of replicating ivory, really, um, in that situation, which, um, and just as beautiful, and obviously doesn't have that connotation of a destruction with it. So, so new materials can um, be um, very interesting. Carol, you yourself conduct a lot of research for your podcast your articles and your books they're always really well researched it's clear that you challenge the topics from multiple angles what topics do you think are important jewelers engage with today and why well i think sustainability is is the word of the moment that's what most people are um, engaged with i think the a sort of pre-loved world is is very interesting at the moment in the auction houses and and people finding things that have been worn before and of course the whole idea of sustainability is um just perfect for jewelry fashion has a lot of issues um fast fashion has a lot of issues and the the waste that's contributed in the world through through fashion is is terrible I don't know if you've ever bought Zara clothes. We've all bought Zara clothes and dry clean it once and there ain't no mending possible. Um, so, I mean, they, they, there's sort of a bit of greenwashing, as we all know, going on. And of course, jewellery is not. Jewellery is created to last. Jewellery is created to be worn by other people and have other lives. So it just sort of slots into this thing as buy better by once, you know, have a piece of gold, have a gemstone, the best you can afford, because that that will last the test of time and you can pass on. And and I think it's one of the ways that you prove your self-expression. It's the biggest thing of self-expression that we have. And especially as we all pretty much dress the same, it's, um, the jewellery is there to, to make a mark of difference to us. So I do think it's sustainable. I think it's how to sell, you know. Department stores are going, high streets are changing, um, social media is there. How is it best for jewellers to use this? And, and I think the big brands are all over jewellery, you know, the sort of they want a part of this global billion dollar industry. And, you know, it's not just Dior and Chanel, it's Balmain, Dolce and Gabbana, um, Louis Vuitton, Prada, all the big fashion houses really are are creating jewellery collections and of course they've got everything behind them and they can do it absolutely beautifully and get the best gemstones fly their clients around the world to see it and it's very hard for other jewellers to compete with this and so I encourage by saying the only way to compete is to do what you do and do it really well offer a fantastic service to hand me to make it unique because people do want something that's unique to them. And the more they're involved in the story of their jewel, the more special it is and the more magic it has holds within it. So, so I think that's how people can compete now. I think unique things can sell on Instagram. I mean, I know the jewelers like Wartsky and SJ Phillips who have fantastic antique pieces. They, they sell them off Instagram because if people are looking for something unique and see it, they will buy it sight unseen, sight untried. And so I think, you know, it is this sort of age of craftsmanship, you know, combined, as you say, with maybe new materials, combined with some, some new technologies. But that basically finished by hand, that has to be the hook to get people to buy now. So I think jewelers are interested in that. I think they're interested in in design and history, and I think you know they're they're interested in hopefully all the things that we're interested in, opening up that that world that has so many stories to share. These are, these stories of creativity are super important, particularly today. I mean, part of an educational context, it becomes harder and harder for. A, a young person to invest in their education it's costly 
is in this climate that we are in very challenging to invest the time and to find the resources to invest in this creativity, invest in in giving yourself the time to come up with these ideas, to do these experiments. And that's certainly something that I think we should all be talking about as well. So it's super important to know how to, to market your work and get it out there so that you can sell fun. But at the same time, when we look in the past, there was always support from government or from society as a whole to support those who are very good artists to, to develop their work. And I think we need to make sure we invest in education continually. And I want to, to make sure we, we enable those opportunities and invest in arts education because we are at risk of losing arts education in the UK. Very, very difficult industry. So that's the other thing I say, you know, if you're passionate about it, you just have to work super, super hard and know that you've got to combat all these difficulties. And one of the ways that's very important is to have a unique point of view. You cannot copy. You can't just go along with the fashion. You've got to be slightly influenced by fashion, influenced by what people are wearing, but at the same time, have something that's personal to you, have your own handwriting on it and your own point of view, because otherwise you won't get traction. And I think if there's anything to encourage people listening to say, we need a new jewellery revolution. I mean, recently I've been talking about, um, I had a wonderful episode on Elsa Peretti with her right hand man, Stefano Palumbo, who worked with her for 30 years and all about her life. And I'm just recording one that I've been researching for and reading a great big new biography by Justine Piketty, the ex-editor of Harper's Bazaar. And there's a big um, retrospective exhibition of Gabrielle Chanel's work coming, opening at the V&A next week. And I'm thinking about how these two women influenced the way we dress and wear jewelry and still do. Maybe half a century later, they're still influencing us. The way Coco Chanel made pearls incredibly modern and the way she was bold enough to mix priceless emeralds with costume glass and mixing it all up and encouraging people who had magnificent tiaras and fantastic jewelry in their vaults to wear faux jewels and she created a revolution and Elsa Peretti after her with her diamonds by the yard creating again influenced by fashion because women were beginning to dress differently and she responded to that and created long loose diamonds by the yard that more girls were going out to work they could afford them they could wear them all day wear them out to dinner not change just keep on their diamonds by the yard that went with all the loose kind of caftani looks of the 70s and I think these two women as I said keep on influencing us and we're, we're ripe for a new revolution we are ripe for a new jewelry revolution so I think that's the task we need to give everyone listening you know, find us something new, a new way to wear it that expresses our moment. Absolutely. I think that's a good challenge to set anyone listening. <laughs> when you talk about all the, the, the episodes that you've got coming up, are there any other ones that we should we could look forward to? You know, it's the fifth season. Is there any other things that you have in the pipeline for us? The so Coco Chanel, definitely on the cards. And actually, I've got one coming up with Daphne Guinness. You know, she's one of the best dressed women in the world, you know, known for that black and white high hair, for those shoes, heelless shoes, great big platforms. And she's been a great um, mentor of, of jewellers, for instance, with Sean Lean creating this mesh long jewel glove. I'm talking to her about that. I'm going to do what I try and do in each season is focus on a master jeweller. And um, this season, we're going to focus on Suzanne Belperon. And then, as very last thing, I love in um, any of my podcasts, if somebody's got a story about Elizabeth Taylor, I get it out of them because there she, I mean, she is the sort of archetype jewellery lover, collector, um, wearer. And so I'm actually devoting a, an episode to her. And I have somebody who worked very closely with her and used to go shopping with her, helping her buy jewellery, travelling, lying in bed with her, trying it on. So we've got a really good 
exciting episode about Elizabeth Taylor. So what have you got coming up on the BAJ podcast, Sophie? The BAJ podcast, of course, follows this sort of pattern. I, I don't really plan it all, but, but I think certainly designers will be continuing to come up to talk about, you know, be very nerdy about jewellery, techniques, materials, things like that. But yes, this post-anthropocentric thinking and, and also perhaps this non-Western perspective, I'm I'm quite keen to, to broaden my scope beyond Europe and sort of invite some voices with diversity in as well. Anyone who listens and has really great ideas that they continue to get in touch as they do. And that I hope that as I talk to people, more paths will, will sort of follow and that I can then just continue challenging the contemporary context with with new guests as they appear great well i look forward to it <laughs> me too for yours uh, carol introduce us to some new young designer makers it will be great yeah that's certainly something the british academy of jewelry also really tries to do with social media if, if anyone is not following us on social media we have graduate spotlights all the time where we're really aiming to to showcase all the people that are entering the, the industry and what new voices to look out for. To um, join the British Academy of Jewellery, do they need to have some jewellery experience? No, you can really start. We have several different courses on the spectrum. So we've got apprenticeships, you've got further education courses like diplomas, and then they've got a bachelor course as well. So you really could pick any of those, depending on what you want to end up doing, whether you want to like you know, poly become a polisher or want to be specific in a certain trade, then you go for these apprenticeships that are with a master in a jewelry workshop. Or if you're really wanting to get the basics of the techniques and a little bit of design, and then you go for the further education. And if you really want to challenge, you know, what will be the next generation of jewelry, then the bachelor's is a really good starting point. So you can enter the British Academy of Jewelry with no previous jewelry experience. All we ask for, all they ask for is passion for the subject that you're really keen. And as you say, it's a subject that requires hard work because it isn't the easiest context. There are a lot of jobs out there. Don't get me wrong. I think of all the creative sectors, there's a, still a very vibrant jewelry industry to go into. But you, if you want to be creative and you want to innovate and you want to invent, you know, invest in your own development, then it is it can be challenging. So anyone with passion... British Academy of Jewelry certainly will have a place for you somewhere. Well, that's very exciting to know. And um, and it is that. It is it is um, a passion. And I do say that it is a, a very overcrowded marketplace, of course, but there's always space for something new. And if you do it well and you've got a new idea, there's always space. Carol, you also do a lot of charitable work and you've actually founded your own charity, The Leopards. Could you tell us a little bit about this work? Yes, well, it's going back to what you're saying about everyone coming in to support the industry and support young people. And actually, I co-founded it in 2016 with Theo Fennell, Stephen Webster, Solange Azaguri partridge and Susan Farmer, who is an industry specialist, uh, particularly in, in diamonds and stones, but has done a lot of sort of marketing over the years. And so together, we thought we wanted to sort of big up British jewellery and shine a light on it, which we've done with the Leopard Awards, which is an initiative that we we award people outside the industry. So it's not inward facing and looking at each other. We take it out and say jewelry is important to everybody. And we've awarded people like Nicola Adam, the, the boxer, the British boxer. We've awarded Vanessa Kirby, the actress who played Princess Margaret in The Crown, Elton John, for encouraging men to wear and buy jewellery. So it's basically people who've elevated the role of jewellery in what they do, in that, in arts and culture, sport, film, music, whatever. And so we do those. And then we try and mentor young people into the industry and help. And we've mentored young people in conjunction with the Princess Trust. And the King actually gave a speech at our last event as the Prince of Wales, which was very exciting. And now we're going to take it a step further and try and reach people who we feel haven't been so lucky to get to college yet or start training. People in, in areas and schools where they would never, ever have come across jewellery in their lives or have for a second thought it's something that held a job possibility for them. 
So we're going to reach out to them by um, this exciting project, which I won't talk too much about because we're going to launch it in November. But keep your eyes out, everybody. And my last Leopard event, I actually did invite some of the graduates that I've met at the British Academy of Jewellery. So hopefully we'll be asking them back to our next event in November. Jewellery podcasting is an activity I have enjoyed greatly over the past three years. Podcasts, articles, books, other research publications will serve as insightful markers of key historic developments and evolutions in the jewellery field, and in some cases beyond. With the world having to grapple with serious challenges, I believe it is important there are a number of resources out there that enable us to engage with the topics that are current and important for our future. For her work as a diligent and influential reporter and for joining me as co-host on this BAJ podcast 50th episode special today, I would like to thank you, Carol. It was really a pleasure to speak to you and I am super grateful for all the work you do and for your time today. Well, it was a complete pleasure, Sophie. As I said, there's nothing I like better than talking about jewellery, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. And I admire the work of the British Academy of Jewellery and um, look forward to coming back next time. So thank you for having me. For now, this was Sophie Boone's In Conversation with the co-host for this episode, Carol Hulton, for the 50th episode of the BAJ podcast titled Reversing Roles. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.